really a great pleasure uh, to welcome Steve Shaker here. I've been trying to get you to come and give a book for some time, and I'm, I'm happy, uh, happy it works. So, so, um, As am I. So, um, so Steve has a, a long history of, um, of great accomplishments, um, which I guess go back probably to before the time you were at Chicago. The first academic appointment was in Chicago. Um, but he was a student of John Kogut and more possibly with Ken Wilson. Um, and um, at Chicago, perhaps the, the highlight is a paper with Chiu and, and, uh, and Pinan, which in some ways revolutionized study of, uh, of uh, statistical systems, universality, global field theory. Um, and then Steve, Steve moved on to Rutgers, where he made contributions to, to string theory, and particularly to non perturbative phenomena in string theory, and predicted the existence of D-brains. Um, developed a matrix model, it's a non perturbative description of string theory. Um, and from there, I moved to Stanford. He was the director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Stanford. He was my advisor. Um, and did work there on cosmology, uh, black holes, um, the thing about the multiverse, and now uh, quantum chaos. And um, so he's a member of the American Academy of Sciences, National Academy, recipient of the MacArthur Award, the Outsider Prize, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it's a great pleasure to have this to you. Huh? This to you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, the list is long. Um, but let's, uh, let's get to the top. So, so it's, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, it is one of my greatest accomplishments to have students like Matt and a few others. <laughs> As you get older, you realize your students are a lot of what you read and you do so. And I'm glad to have left some degree here at NYU. Well, what I'm going to talk today is uh, about the connection between what seem like superficially two different areas of physics, quantum chaos and quantum gravity. And to start explaining this, I, I want to talk about each of these subjects in turn. And let's start by, by talking intuitively about what we mean by chaos. Uh, at its simplest level, imagine you have a box containing a bunch of atoms. And just think classically. Classically, these atoms rattle around, they collide with each other, and they move in a rather irregular way. These collisions change directions dramatically, and the atoms collide, and there's this rather chaotic, irregular motion that you can imagine intuitively. If you imagine a, a group of points on phase space, a rather regular group, and watch it evolve, this, uh, this disk of points will move in a kind of finger-like way, and pretty soon it will cover phase space rather uniformly. And it's this uniform covering of phase space that lets us use ideas from statistical mechanics, and in fact underlies the notion of thermal behavior. And so these strongly chaotic systems with these wildly irregular collisions is why we can talk about temperature entropy and other basic statistical mechanical notions. But now let's turn to, to quantum gravity, in particular the central object of gravity of black holes. When you add quantum mechanics to black holes, one of the big discoveries of 40 some odd years ago now is that they're thermal. Bekenstein taught us that they have entropy related to the area of the event horizon divided into Planck-sized cells. They have a temperature, the famous Hawking temperature of black holes. That's a quantum effect. And given that all our usual experience with uh, thermal objects is that they're chaotic, this suggests that quantum black holes are chaotic. Well, this suggestion was around for a, a long time. But it really became a certainty with the advent of what's called gauge gravity duality. And what I mean by that is that certain quantum gravitational systems are precisely dual to non-gravitational quantum systems. And what a duality means in this context is a map, a dictionary. But if you have a system of quantum gravity and a non-gravitational system, there is a dictionary that lets you translate concepts from one to the other and back in a precise way. Um, and gauge gravity duality means that there's a dictionary between quote-unquote gauge systems, I'll talk about a little bit more, and gravity systems and vice versa. An early example of this is something called matrix theory that I had a hand in. And the general framework, which was discovered by Maldacena, often goes under the name of the ADS 
CFT correspond. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But in this correspondence, there are certain kinds of large black holes, larger than a characteristic length scale, that are precisely dual to a non-gravitational thermal field theory. Ordinary non-gravitational systems that are thermal are thermal because of chaos. Here it's quantum chaos. And so therefore, running through the dictionary, these large black holes must display chaotic behavior, at least, at least as filtered through the dictionary. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So to do so, I have to review this gauge gravity duality dictionary just a bit. So the way you think about this is you think about a cylinder, a solid cylinder. And in the center of the cylinder, you have a certain special kind of space called anti sitter space. It's really an infinite radius cylinder, but don't worry about that for now. The negatively curved space, don't worry about that either. For now, it's just a space. And it, here it's space. Space is two-dimensional in the bulk, one-dimensional time. And then there's a boundary of the cylinder that's one-dimensional space and one-dimensional time. On the boundary of the cylinder, there's a quantum field theory. Here are one space, one time quantum field theory. It's a special type of, conform of field theory called a conformal field theory. Don't worry about that either. Okay. And the fact that this boundary field theory can generate an extra dimension, the radial direction of space, is what goes under the name of holography. You have a non-gravitational system on the boundary that can fill out gravity in the bulk. Now, only special CFTs are holographic. The canonical example is a kind of gauge theory of the kind used to describe, let's say, the strong interactions that has colors, colors of quarks. We usually care about three colors of quarks. But now let's imagine that there are n colors of quarks and n is large. It's a gauge theory with n colors. It's good that it's supersymmetric for various special reasons. Don't worry about that either. Turns out it's a good thing about working at finite temperature that supersymmetry is almost unimportant. So we're, we're there. One of the pieces of the dictionary is that G Newton, that N stands for Newton, is of order 1 over N squared, where here N stands for the number of colors. These Ms are just a coincidence, I think. I'm pretty sure. OK, so here's what a black hole looks like. This is space. Here we have two dimensions of space on the boundary, three dimensions of space in the bulk. The boundary theory is hot. See these little tadpole-like things? Those are the gluons of the gauge theory running around, colliding with each other. In the bulk, the analog of this thermal state is a black hole, one of these large black holes. Time is suppressed here. This gauge theory has n squared quantum. You have n, a gluon carries two color indices. So there's n squared gluons, roughly. In QCD, there are eight gluons. Eight is almost three squared. Okay. When n gets large, it's basically three squared, n squared. So you have an entropy related to the number of fields. That's n squared. And this motion is chaotic. So in some sense, black holes must be chaotic. That's the line we're going to pursue. Well, let's start exploring this dictionary a little bit. One hallmark of chaos is relaxation of thermal equilibrium. Take that box of atoms bouncing around and imagine moving a few of the atoms so uh, the density is higher locally. Well, it'll relax back because of collisions to the uniform density you started. Such relaxation is described by a relaxation time not called T sub R. Sometimes I call it T sub D for dissipation. The same. And you can diagnose this by a correlation function of certain operators in the theory. Here's a correlation function. Some operator at time T correlated with some operator at time zero. This could be time order and retarded. And it should go like exponential of time over this characteristic relaxation time. At long time, it settles back down. Here it settles to zero. It could settle to its uniform value also. And here these brackets mean thermal expectation value at a temperature T, which is 1 over beta. I'll use beta a lot. That's inverse of temperature. 
Now, the gravitational duel of relaxation, that is, if you use this dictionary, what does it mean to perturb the system and let it relax? It means you change the black hole geometry a little bit and let the black hole recover its uniform consideration. It's a very well-known thing in the theory of black holes that there are modes of vibration of black holes that cause the black hole to ring and settle down, to ring down back to its quiescent uniform configuration. And these modes are called quasi-normal modes. They ring and damp, and the damping rate is just the analog of this relaxation time. Well, usually when I talk about this subject, that's where I stop. Quasi-normal modes are a well-known piece of the theory of black holes. Okay, next subject. But in the last couple of months, I could do a little bit better because quasi-normal modes have actually, well, almost been observed. This is this marvelous data from LIGO about this collision of two black holes, where you notice them merging, ringing, and then ringing down. Now you actually can't see the quasi-normal modes in the data. It gets buried beneath the, no the noise, unfortunately. So I've had to reproduce a theoretical template that's the best fit to this data. Here is the black holes inspiraling. They merge, and then they finally ring down. And the quasi-normal modes describe this last little bit where the linearized theory is accurate. So those are the quasi-normal modes that if this thing was an anti sitter space, with a special kind of structure, this would be describing this thermal relaxation equilibrium. So not only are these things well known in classical general relativity, they're part of experimental science. Now, this relaxation of conserved, the relaxation of certain quantities is especially interesting. If they're conserved quantities, like charge or momentum, these relaxations, they're harder to relax a conserved quantity because it has to flow out through the edges of a region. And so the rate of relaxation is related to transport coefficients. To relax charge, you need conductivity. To relax momentum, you need viscosity. And so, in fact, correlators of the currents corresponding to charge or momentum tell you something about these transport coefficients. So, for instance, two-point, it's actually retarded correlators of stress tensors, lets you compute viscosity. This is Kubo formula for those of you that know this stuff. But we can then use the dictionary to do this in gravity. Holography is the name that usually goes under these calculations where you transfer something from the boundary into the bulk. So you can compute the quasi-normal mode of perturbing the black hole, in fact, by a graviton perturbation. And that will give you, let's say, the shear viscosity of this boundary gauge theory, usually called eta. This calculation was done to great effect by Polycostra, Son, and Sterios. And they show that the shear viscosity divided by the entropy density, which is computed just because of the Bekenstein entropy of the black hole, gives you this wonderful number of 1 over 4 pi. This is cleverly set up well, in h bar and cables that are set to 1 for this. Further, Coffin, Sun, and Sternetz looked at lots of substances. And using other arguments, they argued that this viscosity should be the smallest possible in any substance. But I have to remind you that for viscosities, viscosities in transport are produced by collisions in a, in a gas. And viscosity is this peculiar thing that the faster the collisions, the more collisions you have, the lower the viscosity. You have very few collisions. Momentum can be transported very efficiently. So you have a large viscosity. It's like a conductivity. It's a little counterintuitive. So saying that you have a low viscosity means collisions are very fast. And so they argued that the collisions were fastest in this gas duel to an Einstein gravity black hole. And this is a, a wonderful conjecture that we know actually could be violated by small amounts, but it still provides a standard reference value to think about. And in fact, the, the time scale of the collisions that you would get from these formulas is a characteristic strong coupling time scale h bar over k Boltzmann times the temperature. This is a natural time scale in any thermal system. In fact, this, this time scale should have a name. 
And I, I, I don't know what the name is. Some people call it a Boltzmann time, but that's unfair, unfair to Planck. It's not the Planck time, because the Planck time means something else in quantum gravity. So I, we, we need a better name for this basic combination. I'll just call it the strong coupling time scale. And that this is ubiquitous in quantum transport has been emphasized by many people, including Subir and Sachin. But now there's actually another hallmark of chaos that actually gets folded into relaxation, but um, it's distinct. And that's the butterfly effect. Typically in chaotic systems, strongly chaotic systems, you have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. The, the slogan comes from a butterfly, let's say, flapping its wings in Washington Park, Washington Square Park, I don't know where Bernie Sanders are. Right? will propagate and get amplified, and a few days later, there'll be a snowstorm in the Sierra Nevadas. That would be a, a good outcome. Maybe it'll be something worse, a hurricane, and someplace else. But small effects get amplified because of the chaos in the system. The slogan is the butterfly effect. Now, usually when you give colloquia, you try to find interesting, vivid graphics. I was looking for a graphic of a butterfly flapping its wings and doing something else. And there aren't such graphics, but they're not much better than I could draw. The best graphic I could find is this one. <laughs> this is a poster from a movie uh, that I think appeared in 2012. And the tagline, which you might be, not be able to read, is that change one thing, change everything. But as far as I can tell, this movie came out in 2012, and it didn't change anything. <laughs> so this is an example of uh, how popular, our world of popular culture is not completely So that's a cautionary tale. Some systems are not completely chaotic. You have islands of order immersed in islands of chaos. Let me try to be more mathematical about what we mean by sensitive dependence on additional conditions. Um, let's look at classical mechanics. Let V of zero be a point in phase space. It's described by some P's and some Q's. And then take a nearby point, V at time zero, plus delta V, also at time zero. And evolve these two points in time and ask how the deviation of these two points changes in time. The norm of this difference typically grows exponentially in time when you have a strongly chaotic system. You can imagine a collision changes things by a factor of two, and every collision you get an extra factor of two. Things build up exponentially. Oops. And this ex the rate of exponential growth is a number that's characteristic of chaos called a Lyapunov exponent. It tells you how fast chaos, chaos develops. And we'll be talking a lot about this rate of growth of chaos throughout the time. Now, there's a quantum analog of this butterfly effect that actually hasn't been studied that much. And it's, the study of it and its gauge gravity dual will be the focus of this talk. And I'm going to describe the new work. I'll describe this work with uh, Douglas Stanford, who's now a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, and Juan Maldacena, who you know, who's on the faculty of the Institute for Advanced Study. Now, before I go on and describe uh, the main line I want to talk about, I should tell you something about its origins, since it's interesting in terms of the way science fits together. In fact, the origin of this work was not people studying chaos was actually in the world of quantum information, where people were built studying strings of n qubits in two-dimensional Hilbert spaces, and wondering for various purposes, including cryptography and testing quantum gates, how would you build fast approximations to random unitary operators acting on non qubits? Now, time evolution is unitary. Quantum chaos clearly has something to do with random unitary operators. So how fast you can make them has something to do with how fast you can make chaos. And so in fact, these authors found a certain circuit that could make a pretty good approximation to a random unitary very fast in a log n timescale for n qubits. If you think of n as something like the entropy of the system, this is like log of the entropy. And we'll see this timescale emerge later. This time scale was connected to a basic time scale in black holes by Patrick Hayden and John Preskill. And the connection to gauge gravity duality was first made by Sakino and William Susskind. 
who coined this kind of chaos as scrambling. And it was to try to make this work precise that, that initiated the work I'm going to describe. Well, to make this work precise, to make a, a notion of quantum chaos precise, we need a precise diagnostic of what we mean by quantum chaos. Well, the first idea is to mimic this Lyapunov definition carefully. Take two states, chi and chi prime, that are close together in Hilbert space and evolve them in time and watch how they separate. Well, this idea fails immediately because time evolution is given by this unitary operator. I've said h bar uh, 1 is my law of unity. But a unitary operator doesn't change the difference between vectors. It doesn't change the distance between vectors. So even if these states stay out close in Hilbert space measure, they stay close. So this is not what quantum chaos is about. Even though this is the first thing that I thought about, the first thing everybody tries about. If you, if you want to think about the subject, don't try this. <laughs> Here's a good thing to try. Be motivated by classical physics. Roughly speaking, in classical physics, we want the derivative of, let's say, a coordinate at time t with respect to its value at time 0. This grows exponentially in time if you have the alpha. But semi-classically, you could write this derivative first as a Poisson bracket. That you can do in classical physics, using the notion of Poisson bracket in Hamilton's equation. And then you can use semi-classical quantum mechanics to relate this Poisson bracket to a commutator, a commutator of q at t with the corresponding momentum at time 0 with the appropriate 1 over i h bar. This, although we didn't know it, was actually noticed by Larkin and Ochinikov in the 60s. It was in a typically unreadable Landau Institute paper from that time. So this has been known for a long time. And so let's define a figure of merit. We'll call it C of T, which is the commutator squared to avoid any cancellations. And let's say it's thermal expectation value. This would go like something like h bar squared e to the lambda, 2 lambda t. And so this is an example of a quantity in quantum mechanics that should be sensitive to the optimal behavior. But now let's think about what it would look like outside of the realm of semi-classical quantization. Let's give a general picture. And the general picture is quite simple. Think of an operator in some any quantum system, quantum field theory, qubits, anything, evolving in time. I've written out what the time, what the Schrodinger, the, he the Heisenberg operator is. It's time evolution forward, applying an operator, and then time evolving backwards. But if this operator were simple, let's say it was very simple, the identity, the, this factor would cancel this factor exactly. If this is a very simple system, like a free field theory, this evolution doesn't do much. It might, let's say, move the spatial position of this operator. But if this Hamiltonian is chaotic, going forward in time, applying a very simple operator, and then going backward, you might have a wild lack of cancellation, because a small perturbation can touch off exponential chaos. And so then W of t could be a very complicated operator, made, let's say, out of many Pauli matrices whole string sums of products of large numbers of Pauli matrices. And the quarter complication of that operator would be a signature of chaos. You can diagnose how complicated an operator is by commuting it with a reference operator, let's say a Pauli matrix of a certain kind, and asking how this commutator grows. And so this is the same diagnostic we saw before, but argued for on general grounds. The minus sign gets rid of the non anti emission character of the commutator. And so this in general is the kind of diagnostic one wants to study in the quantum system. Now, if you look at a commutator, it's a deep property of commutators that they have two terms. A commutator squared will have four terms. So some of those terms will be simple. They'll be time ordered and will just decay to their saturated value. But two of the terms will not be of that kind, and those are the terms that are interesting. They're the terms that are so-called out-of-time order. 
Here's an example. You apply v at time 0, w at time t, but then back to v at time 0 and forward to w at time t. The times are not ordered. Okay, and there's no time ordering symbol here. This is as ordered. Call this d. The d of t decreases with time dramatically because of k. This is related to the increase of the commutator of the time. This is the object we'll study and try to calculate its properties. Let's talk about how you would actually measure d in a laboratory, though, to get a feeling for it. Better. Well, to measure d, one has to evolve time forward from 0 to t, apply w, and then back to apply v, and then forward again to measure w. In a laboratory, moving forward and backward in time is challenging. Okay. But there's another way that you can effectively move backward in time, and that's to reverse the sign of h. Changing the sign of h and going forward in time is exactly the same as going backward in time. And in fact, this particular process has been known for many years. The classic experiment of this kind is the so-called spin echo. You put a single spin in a magnetic field, it processes forward, does like, let's say, 10 processions, and then you reverse the sign of the magnetic field, and in the absence of any noise, it will process backwards, and after 10 units of time, it'll come back exactly where you started. But if there's, let's say, some noise around, it won't come back exactly where you started. Well, what you need here is you need a many-body version of the spin echo. And after you evolve forward, let's say, by 10 units, you perturb the system a little bit, and then when you evolve, then you evolve backwards and see how close you come back to where you start. If it's a chaotic system, a little perturbation will cause, let's say, the operator of the state to be far different than the one you started with. And that's the way you would measure chaos in a lab. You would run forward with the Hamiltonian, perturb the system, change the sign of the Hamiltonian, and then run forward. Well, how do you change the sign of the Hamiltonian? Well, you need a many-body equivalent of changing the sign of the magnetic field. And much to my surprise, it turns out there are ways to do this. My colleagues at Stanford have proposed an experiment using cavity QED, cold atom magic by detuning off of certain resonances in a way I don't understand at all. You can actually change the sign of the effective coupling between the effective spins in the system. So this is something that is at least in the range of, in the realm of possibility to measure. But it's tricky. It's not like some simple, you know, process where you take the system and study it as a function of time. And I guess that's as it should be. What I want to talk about here the first thing that my colleagues and I did, and independently done by Alexei Kitea, is to do a calculation holographically. That is to take a system, this kind of correlator, in a field theory, and then use the map to gravity, given by gauge gravity duality, and compute this. And it turns out this is a very interesting to compute, thing to compute in gravity. So here is an example of this out of time order correlator. I've labeled these by general times. And I want to warm up and tell you the steps you need to compute this in graph. The first thing you do is you observe that even though this is a thermal expectation value, you can write it as an overlap of two states, where you write the bra as these two operators apply to a certain state called the thermal field double, and the ket as these last two operators apply to that same state. Well, how can you? figure out and get thermal correlators from a pure state expectation value. Well, we have to ask a little bit, what is the state thermal field double? This goes back to work again in the 60s by Keldish and Schwinger, who thought about how to efficiently study real-time phenomena in thermal systems. To make the thermal field double state, you double the quantum system. You take two copies, we call them L and R, left and right. And then you entangle them. Here's the actual state itself. East and are labeled the um, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, the, the Hamiltonian eigenstates, energy eigenstates. You take a sum of the eigenstate n on the right 
Yeah, I can say n on the left, forget about the bar. That's for the common center. Weighted by e to the minus beta e sub n over 2. That 2 is important. So you've entangled these two systems, and you then just look at the right side, compute this matrix element. A short calculation shows it's exactly the same as the thermal expectation value of an operator on the right. The thermal properties of the right system come from entanglement with the left. For instance, the thermal entropy of the right system is the entropy of entanglement between left and right. You use entanglement to generate thermal properties. And in fact, we now understand that in many ways, thermal quantum behavior is the real result of entanglement with the heat bath. Here, you've made a heat bath in the left property. What's particularly useful about this is that the state thermal field du double, if L and R are suitable conformal field theories, these large N gauge theories say, then this state has a beautiful holographic rule. First discussed by Maldacena, building on some ideas of vision. It's a black hole. It's an eternal anti desitter Schwarzschild. <coughs> to describe it, I've used one of these Penrose diagrams which for those of you that don't understand them, I'm really not going to be very helpful. Let me just say, if we were in three space and one time dimension, then I've suppressed two spatial dimensions. Think of those as spheres, just kind of stapled by the diagram. This is time. This is space. And I've warped the diagram so that light travels on 45 degree lines. And the distances are not accurately reflected in the diagram. Some of the high points of this diagram these red jagged lines are the singularities of the black hole. There's a singularity in the past in the so-called white hole. These dotted lines are the horizons of the black hole. And you have a symmetric figure. In fact, you have a black hole for the right system and a black hole for the left system. And they're connected. They're connected by what's called a wormhole, an einstein rosen bridge. So, you have two black holes, each guarded by horizons, connected by a wormhole running between them. The horizons are the, are the, are the dashed lines here. They're running at 45 degrees, they run light like lines. There's one other point I want to make. This is an eternal black hole. So if you're looking at it from outside, oh, I have one point I forgot. These vertical lines are the boundaries of this cylinder. This is where the conformal field theory lives. Here's where the right conformal field theory lives. That's why I called it right. Here's where the left conformal field theory lives. The left. There are two conformal field theories, doubled. That's corresponding to these two black hole boundaries. In flat space, you'd often see these boundaries as triangles. What makes it anti desitter space is that these <coughs> boundaries are vertical lines. None of that you have to worry about. You have to just worry about the fact that there are two black holes connected like this. Let's see, there, was, there are several comments. Here's one comment I wanted to make. In the central region, Near the horizon of black holes, if the black hole is large enough, space looks locally like Minkowski space. The curvature is weak. There's a symmetry of this whole configuration. If you're far away from a black hole looking at it, if it's eternal, it's independent of time. So as you go upwards in time, things don't change. So you have a symmetry of going upwards in time. It turns out you need to go down on the other boundary. So there's time translation symmetry. In the central box, it's locally Minkowski space. The symmetry here is not translation in time. It's another natural symmetry of Minkowski space, which is boost symmetry. To describe boost symmetry by an additive parameter, like translations of time on, the only the additive parameter describing boosts is the rapidity. So translating in time far away here is like boosting in Minkowski space here where time is rapidity. That will be important. Rapidity is the additive uh, number that describes a boost. So the amount of energy you get is e to the rapidity.
So let me say a few more words about uh, this holographic dual. I just said this part. The temperature of these two thermal systems is just the Hawking temperature of this bulk black hole. The entanglement entropy is the thermal entropy. Well, that's just the black hole entropy. And further, we see that the entanglement of these two regions seems to have created some geometry linking them, this wormhole. So this is an example of, of a very important set of ideas that's been developing in the last, let's say, over 10 years. The geometry itself, here this connected black hole geometry, is basically built out of entanglements of quantum systems. So there's a slogan that geometry is entanglement. This seems in many ways to be really true. And a specific uh, slogan having to do with situations like this is that Eon, Einstein, Rose, and Bridge, is related to EPR, the entanglement of EPR pairs. And this is a slogan that Malvasin and Sussman have discussed. I won't say much more about this, but uh, this is a really important set of developments. So now let's talk about the whole graphic calculation of this out of time order flow. So we, let's build up this, these bras and kets we need. So let's apply one operator onto this thermal field double state. Here's W4 applied on the thermal field double. Now, this is a state. We can ask what happens if we evolve the state earlier in time. So we can move this point earlier in time. That corresponds to this pulse that's created by this operator moving backwards along the horizon. As you evolve states in a black hole, pulses backward in time, they get very, very close to the horizon. So this pulse here is very, very close to the horizon. Now we can take that state and we can apply the second perturbation at T3. That's the operator V at T3. That creates a pulse here close to the horizon. So this ket corresponds to two pulses, both close to the horizon. So we've manufactured the ket we need as half of the matrix element that will make our out of time order portal. Now let's make the bra. This is the ket just reproduced here. The bra is V at T1 translated forward in time to T2, and W applied at T2. So that's a state with pulses far up, but again, two pulses close to the horizon. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, yes. but are, are those, like in the left one, is the blue one supposed to be inside the horizon? Yes, it's just inside the horizon. It's, it's uh, to the right of, the, of that horizon. So it's in the, this region here that's, that's hard to see. Well, now what's interesting is to compute the overlap of this cat with this bra. That was what D was. But again, you can see if you follow the evolution of this state forward, this is the cat, you'll have a collision occurring at this bifurcate point where the two horizons collide. And this will be like the outstate, the products of the collision. So what we're really computing in D is an in-state inner product with an out-state. We're computing the S-matrix element for a kind of collision. This funny out-of-time order property is just what you need to study a standard time-order scattering process in the bulk of the black hole. So this is a crucial correspondence. This funny out-of-time order behavior produces a globally time-ordered scattering process that we can study using standard scattering processes in gravity. So this is an S-matrix element in scattering of these two pulses. If these pulses scatter by exchanging a graviton, we can calculate using perturbation theory what this phase shift is. G Newton is the strength of gravity. And gravity has the property that it grows with energy. Here it grows like energy squared. Little s is called Mandelstam s, is the center of mass energy squared. And this reflects the fact that gravitational scattering grows rapidly with energy. This is the kind of scattering we're interested in. 
Well, how high is the energy of this collision? Well, here we use the fact that translations in time are like boosts in the near horizon region. And again, T is the rapidity, so the energy grows exponentially in Z. So the energy is exponential in time, and the, the factor in front is just the temperature squared. So we find out that energy is growing exponentially in time. So this collision is becoming exponentially stronger in time. Exponentials in time are interesting for chaos. Just remember that. Now, this exponential in time is very important. Another way of thinking about it is that a wave packet to escape the near horizon region, let's say one of these near horizon regions, with energy, thermal energy, at time t, it must have enormous energy at time zero. There's an enormous redshift as a mode digs itself away from the horizon and gets far out. I guess I've written it a blue shift. As you go back in, the modes are blue shift. This exponential redshift is the same as this boost factor. This is a basic property of black hole that drives this process. This conformal field theory is a large engage theory, so G Newton is 1 over n squared. So putting it together, this phase shift is 1 over n squared, e to the t, and the right factor is 2 pi over b. So here's our formula for this out of time order correlate. So summarizing, we get the collision of this, of this state with this state. We get the S matrix element starts at some order of one value minus G Newton, one over N squared, times something exponentially growing in T. It doesn't matter what these pulses are made of because gravity is the same for any kind of stuff. And the slogan, the one thing you should take away from this talk, if nothing else, you should take away everything with this one thing, is the onset of chaos is dual to high energy gravitational collision with a black hole horizon. For those of us interested in gravity, it suggests that this kind of chaotic development is a particularly sharp diagnostic of horizon physics. It doesn't matter what's happening out here or out here. It's something happening right on the horizons. It's the sharpest test we know of horizon physics in this uh, and, uh, I wish you didn't ask that. <laughs> What was the Does the minus sign in front of this have any significance? I've been lying to you. Okay. This particular thing, if you compute it, this minus sign is there, but C1 is pure imaginary. Okay. Because this phase just happens to be pure imaginary. The sign will be the right sign for a closely related uh, quantity I'm going to introduce later. So it does have some significance, and you caught me out. Uh, don't, don't worry too much about it. The crucial thing is that this correction grows exponentially. Okay, so now we have this exponential in time, and now I want to make the analogy I was thinking about before. This exponential in time for a, de a development of chaos reminds us of this exponential Lyapunov behavior. This is the point the have made to us. And so, in fact, you should think of lambda L here as being given by 2 pi over beta. There's a universal Lyapunov exponent in this system computed by gravity. And in fact, whoops, lambda L is K-Boltzmann temperature over H-bar. It's 1 over the strong coupling time. Lambda L is 1 over a time. So the same time scale, not surprisingly, emerges here. Again, at the factors of 2. T is the temperature of the black hole. Yeah. And so the temperature of black hole goes down with its radius? In this case, it doesn't. In these large black holes that you find in ADS CFT, the temperature grows up with its radius. They, they have to be large enough that they don't look like little short tail black holes. If you want to study beyond this uh, weak situation where you exchange one graviton, you can describe the behavior of a, one particle scattering gravitationally af, off the other by looking at the gravitational shock wave created by one particle and scattering the other particle off it. This is often called the Iconal approximation. If you scatter 
a charged particle off another at high energies, you think of the classical electromagnetic field that one particle creates. This shock wave warps the geometry. It looks like this in Penrose diagrams. Remember, we were starting with kind of square Penrose diagrams. Don't worry about the dip of the singularity. The shock wave turns them kind of rectangular. And this is a picture of the change of entanglement between left and right that chaos produces. This is actually the way we first started thinking about this. So thought about this. Well, this deviation, here's a picture of D of, D of T, becomes appreciable when this exponential factor beats the 1 over n squared factor. And this happens at a time, beta over 2 pi log n squared, which is beta over 2 pi times the log of the entropy of the black hole. This is often called the scrambling time. And there's a conjecture of Sakino and Sutkine, the fast scrambling conjecture, that this logarithmic growth is the fastest possible in any reasonable physical system. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, well, at the scrambling time, G Newton times Mandel's span mass is order one. S is E center of mass squared. G Newton in four dimensions is one over M Planck squared. So the center of mass energy is like the Planck mass. This is not an ordinary energy. This is an enormously high energy. An ordinary Einstein gravity is not accurate. In fact, you need to include stringy correction or some other completion of gravity. And so we did this. We computed the stringy corrections, at least the leading stringy corrections, to this Lyapunov of expo theory. And in fact, it gave the standard Einstein value minus something. Stringy effects slowed down the development of chaos. In fact, this is a special case of a general result to these authors that says, in general, perturbative scattering can grow no faster than Daniel Stan S to the first power. And this is based on general principles, unitarity, causality, analyticity. And this suggests, with a stringy result, that there should be a universal value. This Lyapunov exponent should be less than or equal to its value in the Einstein gravity. This is very reminiscent of this viscosity conjecture of Hawthorne's son of Serenus. And in fact, it's a numerically precise refinement of the fast scrambling conjecture that says that things should grow no faster than exponential. Here there's a numerical coefficient. What if the scattering is not perturbative? Well, it turns out for the probes we're, we're talking about, non perturbative effects make a far subleading contribution. Because a non perturbative inelastic effect, like making, creating a large black hole and scattering it out, actually makes a. Um, has a very small connection to the outgoing states we care about. So it makes a very small correct correction to this exclusive <coughs> process. Okay, so in some sense, the biggest contribution to this exclusive process are the tails of the wave function that allow the energy not to be very big. So in fact, when you carefully do it, you find the energies that dominate this process are when G Newton times Daniel Stan mass is more than one. And their perturbative string calculations are accurate. Looking for those big inelastic processes is a very interesting thing. You need especially two operators. And that's something that, that's interesting to perceive. Okay, but for these kinds of correlators, it turns out they don't make it. You can show they don't make a big contribution. So Juan Montesano, myself, and Douglas Stanford were actually able to firmly establish this bound on chaos. And we assume just that there are a large number of degrees of freedom, like n squared in the gauge theory. And we needed that there was a large hi hierarchy between this relaxation scale time I talked about and the scrambling time. Canonical example would be one of these large n gauge theories. And V and W would be operators that just, let's say, injected one quantum, so-called single trace operator. Now, it turns out this argument is simple enough that in the closing minutes, I'm just going to give you a brief outline of it to give you a feeling for how you might use just general principles to study something like this. The first is you introduce a well-chosen object. It's a variant of this out-of-time order correlator that also diagnoses chaos. It's out-of-time order in a, in a more sophisticated way. 
At large n, such four-point functions factorize with a disconnected product of two-point functions. So this thing at time zero is some disconnected part plus order one over n squared. There's a picture of f. Here's the disconnected value and the first deviation from disconnected. At later times, f has the same form, fd minus 1 over n squared. And here, the coefficient c1 is positive. Okay? We got rid of the i. That was one of the reasons for changing to that. Large n factorization is not uniformly accurate in time. This is exponentially growing. What are the properties of f? This thing f is real for, sorry, we, we're going to go here to complex time. For real time, that is the imaginary part of time zero, this function decreases and is real in time. Further, this function is analytic in the strip. Now, we expect chaotic decrease for real time. If you add a little tiny amount of imaginary time, we also expect the thing to decrease because of chaos. We assert that this chaotic decrease that f will be less than its original value will continue exactly completely in this half strip all the way up to beta over 4 and minus beta over 4. We're dividing by fd that ft over fd is 1 plus order 1 over n squared, less than or equal to 1. This is the statement that chaos decreases f. How do we establish this? Well, we use the tools of complex analysis. If f is analytic, then you can bound a function in a strip by bounding of the boundary of the strip. So we bound the boundary of the strip. At the vertical time segment, large n factorization is good. So this is accurate up to order 1 over n squared. On the horizontal boundaries, large n factorization was not good enough because it wasn't uniform. But there exists a Cauchy-Schwartz inequality for this cleverly chosen f that bounds f by a time-ordered correlator. Time-ordered correlators are just supposed to saturate at late time, and large n factorization should be uniform. This is the key physical input. We just assume the large, the time-ordered correlator saturate. So then, ft over fd is less than or equal to 1. This is in modulus. In the entire half strip. Well, then, it turns out we're dumb. An analytic function satisfying these properties obeys the chaos bound. This follows from another classic theory of complex analysis called the Schwartz function. <coughs> I'm not going to go through this argument, but let me just give you an example. Suppose ft over fd is 1 minus an exponentially growing function of time. And the rate is called lambda sub L. Now suppose lambda sub L is enormous, it's 100 times the bound value. Then the decrease in f is enormously fast. But now let's move in imaginary time. Analytic functions, if they decrease fast in real time, they wiggle fast in imaginary time. That's what analytic functions do. They wiggle in one direction and decay in the other direction. If this function wiggles very fast, this minus sign will change into a plus sign for a small amount of imaginary time. But if this minus sign changes into a plus sign as a function of real time, this function will increase. So it will violate this condition. So if this condition holds in the entire half strip, the strip is just wide enough to ensure that this condition violates the bound. So the bound follows from the width of the strip and this bound. So then we have it. We have the chaos. So we're in one of these happy situations where we have a general bound on the behavior of thermal quantum systems that's motivated by quantum gravity and holography, but that we can firmly establish just using general principles. And this is a nice situation to be. So where do we go from this? Well, there's lots of directions to go. Let me just mention one direction that seems interesting now. You could ask the question, what systems saturate this chaos value? Well, clearly, these special gauge theories that are dual 
the quantum gravity is saturated. But are there simpler systems? And Kitaev made the remarkable observation that a very simple quantum mechanical system devised by Sachdev and Yeh uh, 20 years ago for uh, studying highly correlated systems for completely different reasons actually does saturate this pattern. The system is ordinary quantum mechanics of n species of fermions. There's a creation operator for a fermion. I runs from 1 to n. And the Hamiltonian is just grouping these things together four at a time. No special order here. Kind of non-local. These things aren't arranged on a lot. By a coupling J with four indices. And J is a Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance control, so the, the average energy is order one. Now, we're used to thinking about large n systems. If you have fields that just have one index, they're vector -like. They're easy to solve. And in fact, this model is easy to solve. You can sum up the large n diagrams. But the diagrams, whoops, not yet. The diagrams are just complicated enough that the model is chaotic. And so in fact, you can compute, or Kitaev computed, the Lyapunov exponent of the system in the limit where the coupling gets strong. J bar gets large, the dimensionless measure is beta J bar. In this limit, the Lyapunov exponent approaches the path. And this raises the question, does this thing have something to do with quantum gravity? This is a question that Super Sachdev actually raised eight years ago, but not as long. And this question is under intensive investigation by a number of authors. And it seems that there's some ways in which it's quite different than gravity. But there's a question, does it have lessons that, that will really teach us something about gravity? And a lot of us are, are trying to answer that question now. So now I'll stop. And I'll thank you for your time. Chief model of this idea is said to be duality the same because so it's going to be integrable or you know, something. Yes. But, but then you also have chaos. And yes. these things seem to be. Yeah, the crucial distinction there is the integrability of n equals 4 super Yangels is for states whose energy is order 1. Okay? With the large n limit, and you look at finite energy states. Here you're looking at a black hole for energy states or energy n squared. And so for states of that very high energy, integrability breaks down. Roughly speaking, you have scattering elements of order 1 over n. But if you have n squared quanta around, then scattering happens very frequently. OK, so it's, it's that, that's the way it gets resolved. So for very high energy states, states of energy n squared, integrability breaks down. So this would mean that at finite n, we should not expect integrability. You, and you don't. You know that, because there, there, there are no 1 over n corrections. Basically, string scattering. Yes? The simple model of uh, subsolid and uh, yes. here you mentioned, it, 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 so I understand it doesn't have vector fields to begin with, but maybe secretly it has as you know, bound states of those fermions. Does it have which kind of vector fields? It has. Gauge fields. Or does it have, well, it doesn't have a gauge invariance. Okay? It doesn't, they, like for instance, you don't project on singlet states in this model. It really has physical states in the bulk that are charged under the OM symmetry. So, so there's some deep way that it doesn't look like a gauge theory. Usually, if I have four Fermi interaction, I would introduce, you know, bilinears of those fermions, and then that can get dynamics. Yes. So I wonder if something like that. Well, there is a bilinear scalar field oh, it's a scalar that, that, field. that's bilocal in time. It doesn't seem to be a gauge theory. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an interesting and important question. Yes. Um, you were a little vague about what operators exactly we yes. expect to have its behavior. Yes. Can you sort of invert the argument and make a statement about what sorts of operators we expect to behave chaotically as opposed to make us clear operators that don't? Uh, In these systems, I don't think there are very many operators well, that don't. I mean, like the eigen thing is Oh, I, yes, I, yes, you're right. I, I see what you mean. Yeah, there, there, there's a basis dependence here. You assume that the system of uh, that there's a basis of what we might call simple operators. Like in, in a qubit theory, there would be a basis, let's say, of the Pauli matrix is acting on one dimensional system. And systems like that, that, that involve, let's say, just a few of the degrees of freedom in the system, um, are those that you expect chaos. 
the whole thing. Uh, but they don't have to be primary. They can certainly be descendants. They, they shouldn't be, the, the analog of the, you, you don't want operators that have order n uh, fields in them that create very high energy states. Okay, but you're right, they're, they're, you need some condition. For those of us brought up on classical optics, what does holographic stuff have to do with it? Where does, the, where does the word come in? Huh? Where does the word come from? I mean, you know, I know what, what it does in classical optics. But yes. I don't know what it does here. Well, here's, it's, it's basically a word used by analogy. It's the word used that a theory on the boundary of a space could tell you something about the bulk of the space. Just like a two-dimensional hologram could tell you about, about an image in three-dimensional space. So it's an analogy. It's not a precise uh, correspondence. So there's no part of it. I think a suggestive, uh, a, a suggestive slogan would be a more positive spin. <laughs> So yes. In the case of viscosity bound, yes. there are some systems that seem to come within you know, order one or magnitude yes. factor of saturating it. Yes. Are there any known systems that come close to saturating this bound? <coughs> yes, why came huh? the, uh, the, 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 the chaos bound? Yes. This is why came on. Saturates it. Let's it. say something that can be experimentally. Uh, this could maybe could be experimentally realized by some cool balance system. Okay. Not yet. There isn't an experiment yet. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Nobody even knows how to do the experiments yet because you have to do this forward and backward in time evolution. The experiments are far more difficult than measuring viscosity. So, so it will take a, a system where you have enormous amounts of control to be able to invert the Hamiltonian or something. So, so the, the experiments haven't even, there, not a single experiment I think has been done yet, although there, there are people are warming up to do. And classical Yamanov exponents are very far. Classical exponents, if you actually put the H bars back in that bound, as H bar goes to zero, there is no bound. Right. Okay, and you can certainly build a classical billiard table with as uh, rapid on the Yamanov exponent as you want. You just have that very high curvature. Okay, so there cannot be a classical bound. Yes? Yes. Yes, for instance, a, a system where the stringy effects are large. As I mentioned, stringy corrections reduce the Lyapunov exponent. So they, they take you away from the bound value. So if you happen to create a model, the, the relevant dimensionless parameter is the size of the strings compared to the radius of curvature of the anti sitter space. If you happen to produce a model where the string length was a, a half, the, this, the radius of curvature of the anti sitter space, which you could do, then the bound would be violated by a fact, I mean, not violated, would not be saturated, let's say, by a factor of two. Now, if you take, you can imagine a system where the gauge theory is weakly coupled, where the bound is violated by a lot. I mean, not violated, is, is not saturated by a lot. In a genuinely weakly coupled system, chaos is very slow, because you, the collision time is very long, and so it takes a lot of time for chaos to build up. So if you have a theory with a really small parameter, and the and collisions happen once every 10 years, then uh, chaos cannot develop quicker than the 10-year time scale. So any theory with a very weak coupling will, will not achieve the bound by a lot. That's what that is the solar system. For instance, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you say what happens to the entanglement? Does the entanglement of both the sides remain complete through the entire process, or is something being concerned? Excellent question. That question makes lots of sense. I should have said a little. This is what the geometry looks like after you have this shock wave passing through it. I'm losing my way. Um, let me just say it in words. And so you can see that, that that figure is warped. Remember that entanglement got coded into geometry. And the fact that that rectangle, that the left and right edges are far apart, means that some aspects of the entanglement are less between left and right. 
And that's precisely because chaos started happening on one side and rearranged the degrees of freedom on one side relative to the other. So the, the technically correct statement is special local entanglements on the left side and the right side are decreased by the action of chaos. Okay? And it's reflected in the warping that you see in that picture. The greater <coughs> length that it's established between left and right sides. So is this, this warping relaxed in the original geometry layer? No, it actually stays. It, it actually, at a very long time, it, it stays. So once, you, once chaos is set in, you've really disrupted the left degrees of freedom from the right. Another way of saying that is even though one side looked thermal, the relationship between left and right was very special in this thermal field double state, very non-generic. And once you let chaos rack, it, it destroys that special arrangement. Okay. So thought of as on one side, it looks thermal and random. But thought of as a two-sided object, it's a really special state in the two-sided Hilbert space. And once you let chaos act, forget it. You're, you're done. Okay. And in fact, if you apply multiple perturbations, it just gets worse and worse. We build a geometry where you apply a lot of these perturbations, a lot of shock wave. The wormhole just gets longer and longer, reflecting the fact that left and right know less and less about each other. So it's bad. Now, it's not as bad as it could be, but it's pretty bad. Okay, let's thank Steve again and continue the discussion.